On behalf of the Partnership for Strong Communities, welcome to the 2023 Connecticut Affordable Housing Conference. My name is Chelsea Ross. I have the honor to serve as the Executive Director of the Partnership for Strong Communities. At the Partnership for Strong Communities, we are leaders and partners in affordable housing advocacy. We envision a Connecticut where everyone has safe, stable home that is affordable to them in an equitable community of their choice. We are here for housing justice, equity, and access. And I'm realizing that also my screen is not sharing, so let's make sure that's going up. All right. Are we cooking now, Danielle? Okay. <clears throat> so there's our vision. At the partnership, we have spent 25 years working to support a shared vision for change that partners are bought into and actively working towards. We are advocates and policy experts. We serve as a trusted source of information to build public will, and we are conveners. We build and leverage relationships with and between diverse and disparate partners, sectors, and impacted communities. Our guiding principle is that housing is a human right. Our mission is carried out through partnership. We facilitate, nurture, and leverage crucial relationships because we are stronger and more impactful when we are united. We work to create and support an anti-racist inclusive culture throughout our work internally and externally. We are committed to policies and practices that reduce disparities in housing and within our organization. We ground our work in facts and data that we use to dispel myths, challenge stereotypes, and fill gaps in knowledge to drive narrative, policy, and systems change. And lastly, we prioritize housing solutions that will be affordable and sustainable long-term. We focus on the full spectrum of housing needs and experiences of communities now and for generations to come. At the partnership, we work to impact change with and in support of individuals and families across the housing stability continuum. As a result of our work, fewer families and people should experience being unhoused or unstably housed or living in temporary, unaffordable, or unsafe housing conditions. All families and people in Connecticut should have access to nine time limited housing they can afford that is safe and healthy and in thriving communities. This includes home renters and homeowners. So how much do you need to afford housing here in Connecticut? Well, the average fair market rent or FMR for a two bedroom apartment is $1,660. This is, of course, a state average, and the cost is often significantly higher in certain parts of the state. In order to afford this level of rent and utilities without paying more than 30% of your income on housing, a household must earn over $5,500 monthly, or more than $66,000 annually. This translates to an hourly wage of $31.93 to afford the average two-bedroom apartment in Connecticut. This is well above the Connecticut minimum wage of $15, and the average hourly wage for many households that hold critical jobs like childcare workers, healthcare aides, wait staff, and more. In fact, the mean renter wage in Connecticut is $22.29, which is not only well below what is needed to afford a two bedroom apartment, but also below what is needed to afford a one bedroom apartment. Rents in Connecticut are continuing to rise while wages stay stag stagnant. Leaving half of our state's 470,000 renter households paying more than 30% of their income on housing costs and more than 86% of very low income renter households struggling to afford their housing, of course, with notable racial disparities. So this is why we are here today. Between today and tomorrow, you'll have access to two dozen sessions that will spotlight a wide array of best practices, collaborations, and coordinated advocacy strategies that create an environment for households and communities across Connecticut to thrive. We're pleased to say that over 600 people have registered for the conference this year, which is our largest crowd yet. We invite each of you to join the conversation at hashtag CAHC2023 across social. We have some amazing sessions lined up for you today. Just a minute, you'll hear from our esteemed keynote speaker, Majora Carter. Following Majora, we have a short lunch break with an optional session on using ancient philosophy to manage your stress, which is worth a try. Once you've eaten and de-stressed, plan to join us for a plenary session looking at Connecticut's housing need, the problem of supply, hosted by the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. From 1 to 4 p.m., we'll head into breakout sessions. We have 11 sessions to choose from, full of local, state, and national experts talking about everything from land use tools and strategies to innovative partnerships to address homelessness and housing stability. Tomorrow, we'll meet back here on Zoom at 10 a.m. for a National Housing Roundtable featuring Deborah Throp from the National Housing Law Project, Dennis Shea from the Bipartisan Policy Center, and Kim Johnson from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. After a short lunch break, we hear from state leaders Representative Eleni Cavros de Gras, Senator M.D. Rahman, Senator Marilyn Moore, and Representative Jeff Luxemburg. 
From one to three, we have another quality set of breakout sessions lined up for you from parents leading in housing policy to affordable housing preservation strategies and communities and everything in between. The conference will close online at 3 p.m. and we're looking forward to seeing many of you in person at our networking reception at our home, the Lyceum in Hartford tomorrow evening starting at 4 p.m. We hope you'll explore the full conference agenda and plan out a schedule that most interests you. You can see what's coming next in the lobby at any time. There's also a PDF version of the conference agenda pinned in the lobby chat. It's important to note that all sessions will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel post-conference. So if you just can't choose between breakout sessions, you'll be able to catch up with them later. I wanna take a minute to introduce you to the amazing conference team here at the partnership and thank them. It's impossible to overstate their dedication and passion. They've worked extremely hard to put together another amazing conference this year, particularly Danielle Hubley, our advocacy and education manager who has seen to every detail of the next two days. I am proud and grateful to support this team. Thank you to Danielle, Alicia, Carlene, and Sean, who you will see throughout the conference, making sure that every session goes off without a hitch or a seven minute delay like this one, no big deal. Thank you also to Jane, our administrative director, who is our behind the scenes hero, along with Emily, who is our rock star intern this year. A huge thank you to our partners at Gallo Robinson, Greta and Don, and our partners at the Narrative Project, Michelle, Zyma, Mercy, Nosheen, and Josh for supporting our work and this conference. None of this is possible without the support of our generous sponsors who make Connecticut's Affordable Ho Housing Conference a success and free for you to attend today. Thank you to our leading sponsor and a deeply critical partner in our work, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, or CHAFA. CEO Nantani Trajan and CHAFA have been supportive of the Connecticut Affordable Housing Conference since its inception, not just through sponsorship, but through delivering and participating in countless sessions. CHAFA is a self-funded quasi-public organization whose mission is to alleviate the shortage of housing for low to moderate income families and persons in Connecticut. Thank you to the Department of Housing, one of our visionary sponsors this year. The Department of Housing's mission is to ensure everyone has access to quality housing opportunities and options throughout the state of Connecticut. They have been a steadfast supporter of the conference and we appreciate their commitment to free professional development for the sector. A special thank you to Commissioner Mosquera Bruno, who traditionally helps us kick off the conference each year. She's traveling, but we wanna thank her for her support of the conference and the work she leads to ensure everyone has access to safe quality housing opportunities throughout our state. Thank you to Wells Fargo, a visionary sponsor of the CAHC. Wells Fargo is committed to building an inclusive, sustainable future for all through a focus on opening pathways to economic advancement, championing quality, affordable homes, empowering small businesses to thrive, and driving an equity-focused transition to a low-carbon economy. Partnership is proud to have Terrence Floyd, Vice President and Senior Social Impact Specialist at Wells Fargo, as a member of our board of directors and a partner in our work. We're grateful to our champion sponsors who've made a commitment to supporting the CAHC. Thank you, Bank of America, J.D. Amelia Associates, m and Bank, Webster Bank, and the Melville Charitable Trust. A big thank you to our foundation sponsors, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, Cone Resnick, and Trinity Financial for caring about the work that we do and helping make this conference free to attend. Thank you to all of our investors, which made it possible for us to bring you two dozen sessions across two days. There's so many that we needed two slides. <laughs> and finally, thank you to all of our supporters. Each of our generous sponsors are featured and linked on our website. Please head to the conference webpage to learn more about each of them and their work and how you might partner with them. If you'd like to support the CHC or Partnership for Strong Communities, you can make a donation using this QR code or on our website at any time. Thank you for your support. Almost there, our virtual offerings do not end with this conference. Save the date for our upcoming intersections of affordable housing webinar series. The first Wednesday of each month throughout 2024, the partnership will host a wide range of conversations with advocates and leaders in other sectors to talk about the impact that a lack of safe, affordable housing has on the work that they do. The first half of the year will include discussions with partners around land use, fair housing, health equity, food insecurity, and homelessness. You can join us to learn more about the intersectional nature of our work. Registration will open next month in December and we'll kick off the series in the new year, so stay tuned. Lastly, please take a moment to fill out our session surveys. After each session you attend, you'll get a notification at the top right-hand corner of the Zoom events lobby, right above the lobby chat. It'll take you about 30 seconds to complete the survey and your feedback really helps us improve the conference in the future. 
With that, it is my pleasure to now introduce our keynote speaker for the fourth annual CAHC, Majora Carter. Majora is a real estate developer, urban revitalization strategy consultant, MacArthur Fellow, and Peabody award-winning broadcaster. She's responsible for the creation of numerous economic development, technology inclusion, and green infrastructure projects, policies, and job training and placement systems. She's also a lecturer at Princeton's University Keller Center. Majora is quoted on the walls of the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture in DC as saying, nobody should have to move out of their neighborhood to live in a better one, which is also the subtitle of her 2022 book, Reclaiming Your Community, um, which I have. There's a link for you in the chat as well, or not in the chat. It's in a little thing called resources. Majora and her teams develop vision, strategies, and the type of development that transforms low-status communities into thriving, mixed-use local economies. Her approach harnesses capital flows resulting from American reurbanization to help increase wealth building opportunities across demographics left out of all historic financial tide changes. Majora's work produces long-term fiscal benefits for governments, residents, and private real estate developments throughout North America. Please join me with a virtual, loud, very quiet <laughs> Zoom welcome uh, to Majora Carter. Welcome, Majora. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So let me share my screen. And again, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you for, for having me as well. Okay. Here we go. Now, -da. I'm going to share that. Let's make sure I get it up there. Slideshow. And I don't need to see me. So I'm going to move this out of the way. It looks good, Majora. We can see your slides. All right, great. I was just trying to lower, make this less, but it doesn't seem like it wants to. Okay, good. There you go. You got it. So thank you so much. <clears throat> and also thank you because this this talk really is about um, our book and the approach that, that we use in it. But in my book, which I'm super excited about because it's almost two years old next February, and uh, it's a, a national bestseller, which I'm sorry, I hope, hope everybody's, I'm happy lots of folks have already bought it, but yes, more should buy. But anyway, but it's about our approach to community development. And so, but what I did with this book was that I put my glossary up front because I wanted people to really know what I was talking about, like early on um, to get it out there. So one of the terms that we use and that's often sometimes considered fairly controversial is low status communities. And that in low status are generally the, the referred to as poor or low income or disadvantaged or underprivileged. And we use low status um, because status implies that something larger is at work. And there's a higher status and there's a lower status and that inequality is a well-established fact. So these are the places where schools or public health, air and water, parks and trees, uh, food options or career opportunities are worse in low status parts of towns than they are in other parts of the same town. And so think of the communities like this near you. They're everywhere. They're inner cities, they're reservations, they could be white Rust Belt towns where uh, industry used to be there, provided you know, um, middle-class job opportunities for folks, but are long gone. Um, and they're all over the world. And the thing that they have in common is that the bright kids who grow up in them are pretty much expected to measure success by how far they get away from those neighborhoods. And they're in urban, suburban, rural spaces. They're the places where inequality is assumed by those both living in them and also from those on the outside looking in. You know, so this talk is about our approach to community development, and, which focuses on talent retention, uh, which is a common strategy in the business community. But think about it, successful companies, they're not trying to, to hire people and pour resources into them so that their competition can hire them away. That's not what they do. Yet billions and billions of dollars of government, philanthropic, as well as private uh, dollars are spent in low status communities uh, to allegedly support the people that are in them, yet overall outcomes don't really change. And, and for those that are supported, 
you know, buy some but some of that money. Um, you know, whether through gifted and talented academic classes or athletic or artistic programs, we don't really do anything to retain those people in those same neighborhoods. But we believe that a talent retention approach to community development can actually, just like they are in, in, success, in successful companies, um, you can use that approach uh, to build great neighborhoods for the people that are born and raised in them. And my hometown is the South Bronx. And it's the kind of neighborhood that one might say has a talent repulsion strategy associated with it. So, okay, hold on. Oops, sorry. There it goes. So this is my the hometown that I grew up in. It's called Hunts Point. Um, this was taken sometime in the 19, early 1980s, which is the same time I was going to high school. Um, and I had to walk by this space. Um, Oh, it was a crack house uh, on the way to the subway, which took me to one of the best high schools in the country, the Bronx High School of Science. But this was a really different place than the, the community that my dad moved into back in the early, excuse me, yeah, the early 1940s. So this is my dad. He's from Georgia. My mom is from South Carolina. They were part of that great migration of folks coming up from the South, from the, the, the American South, you know, escaping domestic terrorism, looking for their great American dream up north. Um, they ended up settling in what was a pretty, you know, white working class to middle class community called Hunts Point. And, and it was really kind of cool because there was a, it was a walk to work community as the, there was a, a, um, a residential core and then folks could walk into the light industrial area for, their, for, the, for the many jobs that were available there. And other folks, you know, black folks from down south, and then black and brown folks from the from the from the Caribbean followed suit. All again, all looking for their great American dream. Um, white flight happened. Uh, you know, there between uh, many you know folks in the real estate industry, just literally banking on the and more about that later, banking on the fact that white folks would, would be concerned that their, that their property values were going to go down because of the presence of black folks. Um, and then there were um, the, the highway construction boom, you know, the cars became king, you know, through various, you know, ver various types of, um, of highway construction projects and, and policy initiatives that took, that took precedence over roads and, and car infrastructure rather than um, transit or, you know, public transit in particular. Redlining, um, you know, the tool that was, was, uh, create policies that were created by actually our federal government um, that, in, that totally told the banking um, industry where they can and should um, make loans um, and other types of, of investments there and in, in communities. And, and essentially the presence of black people were often considered blight and thus high risk. And that's why, you know, the red lining maps were, were literally drawn up so that folks, so that banks would know where not to loan money. And in those in those same places, there were plenty of businesses as well. And so, what would happen there is that businesses were unable to get any kind of financing to improve their their businesses, you know, to buy new equipment or whatever. So, just like residential property owners, if you couldn't get any kind of new loans, mortgages, et cetera, to make your property better and improve it, after a while, it would start to fall into disrepair. And and many of the the the, the property owners would and business owners would literally just move offshore or to write to work states and you know thus leaving those places open uh, for other types of things to come in and what took a lot of the, that in that in those same places that were home for light manufacturing was this kind of, of waste infrastructure that we would see a lot of um you know and this is in in the South Bronx or at least my part of the South Bronx where all of these kind of things happen you know in that air in that area. Oh, and um, this is around the time that when I came in, um, I remember I was about four years old, a little less than that, probably when this photo was taken. And um, and I'm literally on the phone with um, Santa Claus telling him that I'm here with the Easter Bunny, uh, telling him that, you know, I've been a really good girl. So take good care of me. I consider this one of my very first networking opportunities, actually. But this is what I grew up with. Um, remember the the the, the all the financial disinvestment that was happening, you know, that started literally from the top, you know, of, of our country that essentially made these places like ripe for 
financial disinvestment. Um, you know, so landlords were often torching their own buildings, committing arson because insurance was actually some of the only kind of um, you know financial resources that folks could get after a building burnt. Um, you know, but and some lands were literally just absolving themselves of all responsibilities and just handing you know the keys over to the tenants that were in these buildings. But seeing much of this happen um, in the Bronx, it happened all over the country. But for the most part, I think the Bronx was particular, you know, in and how much devastation that we had. We lost about 60%, you know, of our population. Fortunately, not all of them died. Um, but as you can see, much of the properties themselves were completely not habitable. So this is what happened, you know, to them. And so, but what was really interesting, you know, about being growing up in the South Bronx during that time is that we saw information, you know, on the news and, and read stories about how awful our neighborhood was. And it was a terrible, terrible, terrible place and that nothing good happened there. And, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to lie and say that it was just like all hunky dory because it wasn't, but, you know, there were still plenty of people that were left. Like my, my family couldn't move. Like the house that my dad bought was literally worthless, except for the fact that it was the shelter that my family had. So that's where we stayed. Um, so, and there were plenty of other folks just like that, you know, in the community. And, but again, if you listen to the nightly news, then you would, you would think that nothing good could happen there. And, and I'm not saying that, um, cause I couldn't, you know, that it wasn't, you know, look, I did get to witness the summer that I turned eight later in the fall, the beginning of the summer, my um, you know, the buildings on either end of my block burned down. And then at the end of the summer, uh, my brother was killed in a drug wars, but still there were amazing people that loved us, that loved each other. And we were a part of that. And that is still the same to this day. Um, you know, we still have this awful reputation, you know, being from the South Bronx, but there are folks here who are dedicated and, and wonderful. And, you know, they actually are these talented folks that, that offer much to the world and of course to our community. They're daycare providers, they're people who are, you know, social media, Instagram stars, and uh, they're filmmakers, they are um, medical professors, and they're, they're lawyers, I mean, they do all sorts of amazing stuff. This young lady with the Cozy with my rosé t-shirt is a um, amazing um, entrepreneur. And she combined her two greatest loves, wine and, um, and books and reading and into the lit bar as in lit like tipsy and lit like literature. She put them all together, wildly successful and uh, super excited for her. Um, and then there's, we are also, because the South Bronx is it sort of like, a, it is sort of like a cultural hotspot with between music and all sorts of other stuff happening here. Marcus Samuelson, who is, you know, a celebrity chef for all of you that are into that kind of stuff, you know, has absolutely visited, you know, our community, um, seeing what we got to offer. Um, the young man in the middle photo there is Christian Navarro, who is, um, for some of you might remember his, of his his breakout role was in a, a, a Netflix show called 13 Reasons Why. And, and it was all about um, this, uh, and it was all about, you know, a teenage suicide and just like all the angst associated with it and being a teenager. And that was his breakout role. He's from literally right up the street from me. Still, his family's still there. But um, when you you know, so all of that to say, this was the kind of place that made people feel like you know, we know we've got some stuff to offer, but, you know, that was definitely not me coming back, you know, at, at a few years after college, um, you know, I was going to grad school and I only had to, I had to move back into my parents' house because I needed a cheap place to stay and felt like an utter defeat to me. Um, and actually for the first year or so, I think I just, all, I mean, I would sleep in my old bed, but then I would leave my house super early in the morning and get back very late at night just so that I didn't have to deal with the neighborhood. And it wasn't until I actually got a, a um, you know, a, a writing gig working in the Bronx that I actually got to sort of connect with my neighborhood, you know, again, in a way that showed me like, oh, no, no, there actually is some really cool stuff here. Um, but that's also around the same time when I learned that our city and state were planning on building a huge waste facility on our waterfront. And, and it was just one of those moments when I realized that here I am, 
you know, running, spent the bulk of my, all, all of my like young adult life running away from the South Bronx and, you know, both physically, but also mentally and emotionally. And, and that's when it hit me that, you know, it was great that I did have this education and some distance beforehand, because I realized that our city doing what it was about to do, which is open up another huge waste facility in our waterfront was done because we happen to be a poor community of color that was politically vulnerable. And again, that education and distance served me really well. And that's when I realized we can do something that I could either see, act like I didn't see what was going on, you know, with all that was the city was planning on putting out there for us, or I could be a part of the change that I wanted to see in my own neighborhood. And, and I chose the latter. So, you know, so we definitely got very involved in the city's plan to, or rather to try to encourage the city to do something different in terms of their what we considered a very racist, discriminatory solid waste management plan and and actually do something that was a lot more sustainable, um, you know, that didn't overburden poor communities of color. But the other piece that was sort of fun for me was realizing that it, it, we weren't just about trying to, you know, push and be consistently fighting against what we knew needed to be fought against. It's like, you know, doing what the city was and state were doing was not cool. But it was also kind of like, can we be, how about fighting for something that we want? Like, what, what are we fighting for as opposed to what are we fighting against? And so the same time that we were working on this um, solid waste management plan and advocacy, I also started working on um, the, the, the ladder. And, um, and so I kept getting these notices from this woman who was running as th through the U.S. Forest Service and through our New York City Parks Department, this opportunity for a um, to, to work on threatened urban rivers. And we have the Bronx River in New York City. And I'm sure many of you are from Connecticut, so you probably you'd come down it sooner or later. And um, and so the Bronx River um, is the, it was the only true freshwater river in all of New York City. Went through a whole bunch of crazy stuff through the Robert Moses, um, you know, era where he straightened the river um, literally uh, to create a more, um, you know, nice path for people for people in cars to travel down a parkway to have a nice view of the river. Um, uh, unhealthy though it was. And so we qualified as a threatened urban river. And so this um, Jenny Hoffman was her name was just like, look, there's all this stuff. You can do great things here. Um, you know, there's a tiny little seed grant work on it. And so fortunately, you know, for me, I had a dog who literally took me jogging one day and pulled me into what I thought was just another waste facility or just a big old dump, you know, on our waterfront. And because literally you couldn't see the anything past it, but past the street. And so my dog took me, like literally pulled me through this thing that had weeds and piles of garbage up over my head. I went through it. And then at the end of this thing, once the, once the space around me cleared, I saw the water and it was this amazing you know, expanse of, of this river that I'd honestly never seen in, in my life. Um, and it was super cool um, to see it at that time. It was like six o'clock in the morning. The sunlight was glinting, you know, off of the water. It was just, it was just magic. And I went back and wrote that little proposal and um, it was just $10,000, you know, to work on it. And we were able, because of that, you know, we were able to buy lunch for, vol for the, the few volunteers that showed up at first, because people could not imagine that there was anything, you know, actually really happening on our waterfront. Um, we did, uh, you know, all sorts of, we, worked to create um, uh, partnerships, you know, with uh, folks that actually had things like front end loaders so that we can pull up, you know, m materials like this and just get them out of this of the spot. And then what we were left with was um, this little beta version of a park um, that was super exciting about uh, and to go through. But then we ended up realizing that we also needed to provide some programming because even though we knew, because we heard from, from people that people would take their kids out of the neighborhood to, you know, experience things like parks and waterfront development developments, but we didn't have the, the opportunity to do that. So we would do things like programming for everything from canoe rides, um, boat building programs. We even like let folks like senior citizen programs up here know that there were things like um, cool, uh, that they, there was space for the, the old folks to, to practice salsa. And it was just very, very cute. Um, we had a great time um, being outdoors, doing that kind of stuff. And this was one of my favorite photos that still to this day, as you can see, I'm simply posing 
in this uh, photo because I was, I was like, look, I spent seven years and here we are at the groundbreaking um, announcing a $3 million fund that's going to go into totally re redoing this, this, this site into what is going to be an amazing place. So yeah, I was just, I was just posing from a picture. Um, but here we are, um, you know, went from that to this, and this is the Hunts Point Riverside Park as it exists right now. Actually, that 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 was a photo literally the day after all the the sod and and the and the plants were were put in just to start to 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 grow. Um, and it's really just become like this awesome spot that folks from the community now just act like it's always been there. And and I'm all for that because that's when you know they they are su super invested, you know, in a in a space. And, uh, you know, for us, it was just like the most beautiful thing to be able to, to offer something like that to the community. And I got married there actually not long after it started. Um, and this is my, uh, the dog that literally led me there. Her name is Zena, um, or was Zena. She passed away many years ago at this point. Um, but it was an awesome thing, but there she is with her well-deserved, um, national award for excellence in urban design, which I'm very excited about. But what was another interesting thing about all of building something like this was, um, you know, it really sort of led me into this idea that, you know, commu that the, the community development was, was bigger than than just environmental development or housing development or um, economic development. It actually was inclusive of all of it, and I really wanted to be a part of that. And how do I take the the tools and and the um, you know the things that that that, that I've learned over just that part of, of my work and transfer it, it into um, what the what also what the community needed in terms of just overall real estate development. And and for me, it was a fascinating moment to be like, oh. This is this is an opportunity to actually also ask folks in the community like what makes a great neighborhood for you you know hearing you know so it being start just starting to get in on my journey about how um, we we don't design our communities for the especially low status communities for the people that are in them and so we started doing focus groups and. Um, you know, uh, lots of surveys just to get that just to gauge that kind of get that intel from folks and so. When we spent, and a lot of the the surveys that we did were actually from kids, seniors um, in high school who were about to enter, um, you were about to go to college, and because and this was a big deal for us as a community because we had had um, because that that those graduating classes over the time that we did that they were some of the first kids over the of the past thirty years. We had more kids during that time period graduating high school and going to college than we'd had in the previous 30 years in the neighborhood. So it was like a big deal. And so, of course, we wanted their input. And so we would ask them questions like, so what do you think that the neighborhood needs now? And almost to a fault, to a person, they were just like, well, we need more um, uh, senior, we need more uh, affordable housing, but only for the poorest of poor people. And then we need homeless shelters because that's where they're probably going to end up. So you just need some overflow. Um, and then you need more health clinics because everybody is sick with diabetes and obesity and heart conditions, and all that stuff. And then you need more programs for the kids to keep them out of trouble, even though we thought it was sort of funny that these, pro these kids um, they talked about were not much younger than they were at the moment. And so then our follow-up questions, especially for the, the high school seniors was, so when you, you know, after you get out of school, you know, get yourself a career, are you planning on coming back to the neighborhood or, or neighborhood like it? And they would be like, I mean, literally recoil in the way that only, you know, teenagers can recoil at adults. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was really funny because they were just like, why would I do that? Like, seriously, you said it yourself. I'm about to graduate high school, go away to college. Like, why would I come back to a place like this? To them, everything that they described were markers of poverty, things that they should get away from. People like them did not stay in places like this. And they made it real clear, 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 clear. And and, and I think what they were responding to, actually, I know what they were responding to, you know, was the fact that then in the nonprofit industrial complex, you know, and also government, you know, supported much of that, that, that thinking is that poverty is a cultural attribute. Something, and is it, the question, is it something worth, preserving. And when you looked at development in those areas, it was very much just like that. Um, you know, it was all about like, how do you create more opportunities to sort of like 
maintain or support the people in poverty rather than um, rather than you know giving people an opportunity to do better you know within their within their communities so that they're moving up and out of poverty and so when we continued to ask these questions about it um, what we realized was that there was you know, we couldn't we couldn't ask the question like, is poverty a cultural attribute? Is it part of your culture? Blah blah blah. But we what we could ask them is like, well, what are you looking for in the community that you desire? And that was a little different. Um, and so what we saw, and it was so clear that what we saw were things that we didn't see what they wanted were the things that they literally could not find in their neighborhood, and then would take their time, their beautiful selves, and their money and go spend them all in those other places, not in the place that they were from, because they were not, none of the, the the stuff that they wanted were listed, you know, the things that you could readily find, you know, in the neighborhood. And that's the kind of things that they, you know, later on would identify as the things they didn't want, you know, or they didn't like in their own neighborhood. So they were really clear about that. And, um, but again, if you, but again, the way that our community was often developed, you saw the same kind of things happening that kind of actually created more and more, you know, of of the of the the don't want column. And what we noticed is that in in low status neighborhoods, there's really only um, two kinds of real estate development, like the way community development actually happens. And the one that we see, we see, the, the, we see, and it's, no one likes it. You know, it's, it's, I, that we can talk a little bit more about that later, but it's, you know, um, gentrification, which leads to displacement. And that's the one that scares everybody. Um, even though we, we honestly do believe that it, much of it has to do with it's, it's a product of reorganization and the fact that we aren't, you know, creating as much um, supply of any kind of housing to meet the demand for for it. So that's sort of the gentrification leading to displacement that sort of creates, you know, that dynamic where people feel like they can't, they're going to be displaced. And then the other kind is something we call a poverty level economic maintenance. And that is um, so you see things and you know you're in a low status community when you don't see you know opportunities for lots of diverse sort of affordable you know uh, types of food options you know whether it's you know different kinds of restaurants great affordable um, you know uh, uh, grocery stores even uh, farmers markets green markets things of that nature but you'll find plenty of you know fast food joints or um, fast food joints as well as like kind of greasy spoon places as well. Um, you can find places to spend your money and, you know, where local economic development. Or sometimes they're not that local, but, you know, but for the most part, many folks, you know, indicated that they felt like the quality that of the ones in the neighborhood were really not where you wanted to spend your money. So it made you often take your money and spend it elsewhere. Dollar stores or 99 cent stores, um, uh, You'll often find them as a major uh, retail option in in a uh, in low status communities, and pharmacies and uh, and health clinics as well. Definitely, this is you know we are low status communities in general are a huge uh, part of the balance sheet of pharmaceutical companies, multinational and otherwise. Um, and so when you think about it, there's a lot going on there that. Uh, um, we we see and, we, and it is because of things like um uh what do you diabetes obesity heart conditions certain types of cancers some of them from environmental conditions that exist in low status communities as well and so we want to and we see a lot of that happening and also you'll definitely see um things like places to get self medicated you know from liquor stores um you know or and now smoke shops you see a lot of them as well. Um, if you want to save your money, you're probably not going to find many places to do that. Um, instead, what you will find are things like uh, pawn shops or payday loan places, check cashing stores, uh, even rent -a centers but they all end up charging you a premium to use your own money. And last but definitely not least, you'll see an enormous amount of very high subsidized affordable housing. And you know, so of course the developer gets, you know, a, a nice little fee associated with it. But um, ultimately when combined with all the rest of these poverty level economic maintenance projects, what you get is a, the concentration of poverty 
period, because all of those kinds of, of, of poverty level economic maintenance projects, um, they're, who would they cater to? Those in high poverty. And what we know when you continue to concentrate poverty, it exacerbates, and this is just the stats associated with it. The numbers just don't lie. Um, you concentrate low health outcomes, low educational attainment, um, higher rates of folks being involved in the justice system, um, bad policing, you know, lower values, you know, of homes for people that that do own them, you know, within within communities like this. Again, all statistical, you know, analysis will reveal all that and does. Yet somehow or another, we don't really look at this as the kind of thing that we might want to continue. We might want to just like analyze it critically and wonder, should we continue to be concentrating poverty the way that we do using the time tested strategies that we know will only make other things worse. So we, but, and so we hear often that, um, you know, for, for many folks that, you know, well, the alternative is that the place gets gentrified and, you know, and when you start to see things like uh, doggy daycares and, you know, and, and cafes where you never saw them before. And I'm going to tell you, I do not think that's when gentrification starts. I think gentrification starts when you start to feel when people in Los Angeles communities don't see the value in their own homes in their own community. And so that's when you start to see predatory speculators, you know, take full advantage of that, you know, psychological dynamic that comes from living in a low status community when you are led to believe that there's no value there and you internalize it. So these are just some of the, the notices that I've received under my door um, or in the mail, you know, you know, telling me that, you know, that they'd be somebody would happy to take, you know, these, my, my home off of their hands. Um, and, you know, they're assuming, and I, unfortunately they're often very right that um, we don't know the value, you know, of, of property within our own community. And, uh, you know, and that's one of the reasons why but private equity real estate owns about 20% of all American homes right now. All. 20% of all Ameri local American homes. Um, and they're, guess they're not in high opportunity areas. They are only in low, they started it, started off in low status communities. So we want to be clear about how that is working. And I'm not talking about like just the smaller, um, you know, I'm holding companies that also do the same exact thing. That's just private equity, real estate companies. Again, destroying the idea for the American dream to, to proliferate, you know, because we're just losing them all the time. So our talent retention approach is all about creating, you know, opportunities for people to see value right where they are in part because they are in them. <laughs> and so, but you want to surround them with the, with a really beautiful, natural, as well as a high quality, um, you know, built environment. And you want to have like commercially viable um, third spaces around you. Um, and third space is neither work nor home, but a place that can allow you to build community. And so, yeah, sometimes it does involve, you know, creating a sense of, um, you know, of, of value. And sometimes it is about paying for things um, you want, because you want to promote community centers. Or, or the idea of community without necessarily having a community center. So we use the term very loosely. And that's why I think third space is a much better phrase to use. And I'm not, and so when I say community center, I'm talking literally like the kind that, um, you know, developers will 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 um will will tack on to a project to get more FAR and to get more units, you know, into their into their buildings. But they're not the kind of places that anybody really wants to hang out in. Um, we also want to think of it much more broadly around economic development because you want to make sure that there's like operation oppor opportunities for job creation, um, you know, as well as new business development with with opportunities for folks within the community to to own and operate some of those businesses on their own because nobody wants to have their communities conflated as a as a with poverty you know as part of its culture and um, because people want to feel good about where they are um so remember the crack house that was on my way to school um you know as i <clears throat> You know when I went to the went to the subway well we were able to acquire that um that 
same storefront and over many years, um, you know, since then we, it's now operating as the Boogie Down Grind Cafe. And, and so Boogie Down is um, another name for the South Bronx. It's also the South Bronx is also the birthplace for hip hop. Um, you're all very welcome. And, uh, you know, and it is this amazing cultural export. And so we took what, we, and a part of our culture. So we wanted, you know, a place that reflected that. And so literally the walls, um, you know, are, you know, covered, you know, with, with, Early, especially early album covers, you know, sort of like heralding the birth of hip hop. Um, you know, there's signage, we call it urban archaeology of the kind of things that were in the neighborhood, like that big liquor store sign behind me. You know, we took photos of, of some of the, the graffiti that was on, you know, that 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 folks would put on subway trains. Um, we, you know, the space is used for art exhibits, for open mics, for poetry slams, for credit repair workshops. You know, the community really does fill it with the kind of programming, thus creating community spaces that make people feel really good about where they are you know and um and and because you know we, we definitely challenge the idea that you know oh, coffee shops are like these the harbingers for you know for, especially for white gentrification you know in uh in poor communities of color and and i was just like look okay first of all coffee in case y'all didn't know comes from the blackest and brownest parts of this planet secondly it's like the blackest beverage on the planet. You know, literally we all drink it, but it's more for us, it was more about creating, you know, a gathering space that allowed folks to like do community, but not everybody thought that. And we were at one point um, protested by, you know, a, a social justice uh, group, um, you know, and some of their friends you know, accusing me of being everything except a child of God. You know, I'm selling out the Bronx. I'm doing all sorts of really horrible things to my neighborhood. Um, and uh, it was just a really interesting moment, um, which was so odd because it was a really, it's so ironic because the day that we were protested, there was a workshop being presented at the cafe and it was a group of, of, of lenders that were there to offer um, low interest loans to homeowners who might be being threatened with with losing their homes and small business owners and also zero percent interest loans and it was interesting because we took advantage of both of those of those 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 type of programs in just in service of, of our own businesses so we knew it was for real and we were just like yes of course you can come and use our space to make this happen but um it, that didn't happen and this you know was a a, a young woman who um woman who um is from the neighborhood you know she's like the daughter of of um of Honduran immigrants her husband's Jamaican and together you know they were some of the first uh investors you know in our little cafe which is super, super cool um this is another project that we worked on or we're still working on this one it's a, a former rail station that was designed by one of America's first Stark attacks. Um, his name is Cass Gilbert, um, really famous, especially at, at, at when, around the time when he was doing things like building the uh, the Woolworth building and um, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court building. And, you know, and the railroad magnets at the time were building rail stations, you know, that so, of course, they would only hire like the most expensive architects they could find because they love the status. And um, and so this one was was um, in Hunts Point, which is the neighborhood that, that I was born and raised in. But as cars became king and rail service slowed, um, this one, this building was also shut down to rail state service. Um, There's some talk that it was supposed to reopen, but it never did. They subdivided it into smaller storefronts. And um, and then when the owner of the ground lease died, um, Amtrak, who was the owner of the building, just, you know, after a while, you know, evicted all the rest of their tenants because they were sooner mothball buildings rather than, you know, deal with being a landlord for a bunch of like small owners. And so what they, so they got like a couple of years free rent because nobody was, was getting it from them. And, um, and then everybody left and the building was vacant. And that's when I approached Amtrak and said, I'd like to acquire this building and let's see what we can do before we even acquired it. I had kids from the Navy, hired some young people from the neighborhood to, to do the, to paint it, um, to get rid of the graffiti that had been accumulating on it, you know, since it'd been abandoned. And um, it was super exciting, you know, to sort of see that space. But what was even better for us was knowing that we were going to transform this, you know, into something that we knew that the community needed based on some of the, the research that we heard from them. So my husband and I actually did the first um, 
demolition of uh, interior demolition of one of those old storefronts, which was a pizza shop. And then we hired folks from the community to come and do the rest, thank God. And what we're doing now is transforming this space into an event hall. And, you know, we've been using it that way since um, 2020, uh, 2021. And it's just like we've had everything from pop-up markets, um, you know, so local vendors can sell their work. Um, we've had film and video shoots. You know, we've had um, everything from, uh, you know, Malik Yoba, who is a, an actor and born and bred in the Bronx and who does really cool. And now he's doing this event called, um, uh, rather a series called I Build New York. Um, and it's all about New York City real estate development. And then he, and so the first one was the first uh segment was actually a covered black and brown developers. And I was in the first one. So of course we had to screen it at my spot. Um, it was really kind of fun to, to sort of be there. It's been, it, the acoustics in this place are just unbelievable. So we've had all sorts of performances there. Um, oh yeah. And, uh, uh, French Montana. Well, actually, that was just a music video, but um, but French Montana and 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 Lola Brooks were there the other night. Um, I, just a little little hit for you. Um, DMC from Run DMC is actually going to be at my space right now, shooting his own video music video in like a few minutes. I'm super excited. I can't even tell you. Um, and uh, you know, Tarana Burke was over at um uh. Uh, she when she dropped her second book as a paperback. She did the opening at the at at Bronx Landy as well. Um, we've had pro wrestling there, which is it it is one of the most fun things I think I've ever experienced. And I couldn't believe that it was at my spot. It was super awesome. Um, and so now you know we're trans we're you know in sort of like the in between stage, like getting all of our financing stuff together. Um, you know, sort of still using the outside to support local real and actually international graffiti artists. Um, this was like an all female group, but at the bottom line is it's going to we're taking it at back and going to be doing something that's very similar to the. Um, uh, you know, sort of like reminiscent of the of the old space itself, like back when it was first built. And we're super excited about it and bringing back some of that original, you know, um, architectural character. It's I'm very excited about. We're also going to be giving, um, you know, folks in, in the in our community the ability to um, to invest in it. You know, thanks to um, changes in the into um, you know thanks to SEC regulations so about crowd. Uh, funding investment opportunities. So folks for as little, I think we haven't done it all yet, but I think probably between 100 and $250, you know, they'll be able to purchase re revenue shares, you know, within our space. So they'll get the same rate of return as somebody who's like putting in, you know, hundreds, millions of dollars, whatever. It's not that much, but, you know, we're super excited about it either way. But this is the real reason why I'm even, you know, at this, this place in my life. We had this as a, um, we had this because my dad was a Pullman porter, you know, back in the 30s, like up until into, well into the 40s. And he um, wanted, you know, he wanted his American dream, just like everybody else. And he, um, you know, won $15,000 in a horse race. And um, at that in California, he carried that cash back into New York as he was living in Harlem at the time. And he wanted a place to, um, uh, let's see, how do you say it? He wanted something that would give, he wanted to live like in the area where his li main line was. And the station had been closed at the time, but there was talk that it was going to be reopened. So he went up to this neighborhood, was in Hunts Point, it was all white at the time, um, found a, a local um, Italian family who was willing to sell to this big old black man um, and uh, for, for the $15,000 cash. And he was able to buy the house that I eventually grew up with along with like several, many of most of my other siblings as well. So, so I thank my daddy every single day, I have to say. Um, but then my, my last, uh, his last job was as a the janitor at this, you know, God forsaken place. It was called the, the um, Spofford juvenile detention facility. And my, and, um, and I remember my dad talking about it to my mom when he didn't think any of us kids were listening about how terrible it was and how he wished our house was bigger so that we could take in more kids. And we were one of those houses where we did, I mean, somebody was always staying at our house, um, who needed some help. So, um, we did that. And so, but it, you know, our house didn't get any bigger, but finally the, um, the, 
between the beautiful help of both children's aid advocates and prison reform advocates, this place actually was finally closed, you know, in the mid 2010s. And, um, you know, so because it, it did, it broke children a lot. And so once it was closed, and then I realized like, that's what we need, the place, a site that big. And it was on five acres of land. And I was like, this could be the thing where we could have, you can show that real estate development could be a transformational tool um, for low status communities with, with, with mixed income housing and mixed use commercial development. So I was actually able to convince the, the city under the, the couple uh, mayoral administrations that go, go the Bloomberg administration to consider this site as a site for mixed income housing and mixed use commercial development. And so we just went to work, you know, um, assembling a team and thinking about what could a potential program for that site look like from, you know, mixed income housing and mixed use commercial development, you know, looking, you know, doing economic analysis as to what were the economic growth trends for both um, entrepreneurship as well as job creation. Um, you know, we saw, you know, that manufacturing could actually make or was making a resurgence in, in terms of tech apparel and also food. Um, and then also recognizing that you can design public spaces as ways that encourage safety, um, you know, commerce um, and community. And, and just, it's a great democratizer as well. Um, and then of course, you know, commercial and retail opportunities so that the dollar could circulate throughout that, that economy. And what was also super exciting about this was recognizing that our, um, <clears throat> that the so the topography excuse me <clears throat> that the topography of this land was very um very similar to a lot of post industrial american cities and wherein you had on one side you had the um uh uh, the the residential area and right next door to it was where the manufacturing sector kind of started. And in that middle area, it was like a sort of a weird, almost like no man's land for, for zoning and planning and not much happened there. And case in point, what happened, you know, between this place that was like the it, residential because it was a jail. So that's residential. And right on the other side where the manufacturing started there's a truck engine rebuilding shop you know a parking lot for trucks that was only open at night um you know there was like some illegal chop shops and things like that but mostly what everybody in the neighborhood knew is that this this street that like hinge area between where the 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 residential and the industrial areas you know connected where was where truckers would go to pick up a prostitute because it was such a lonely kind of street but imagine what would happen if you sort of like and you know, totally just like ramped up, you know, what it what it was and, and really activated the ground plane of that area, you know, created, you know, businesses where there were three different ships, where there was um entrances to 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 homes as well as you know different cultural activities. And you're creating a dynamic where good uses will drive out the bad ones because that's what you want to do. Um and so we also were just like really keen on the idea that this should not be like, oh, look at a really one, one nice project, you know, in this otherwise con completely low status neighborhood. And because we don't really believe in the future of low status communities actually becoming better because poverty is still very much seen as a cultural attribute of our communities and not not a, a, not a state in which people, you know, find themselves in and can move out of if given the opportunities to do so. So we wanted to raise the bar for what passed as for real estate development, you know, within this low status community in particular. And so we assembled this team, oh my God, that had more, um, you know, women and people of color developers on it and, and equity roles, not just some cute little sub so that you can check out a diversity box, but real, real equity partners on all of it. And, um, you know, we put together a, a, a program that included 1,200 units of mixed income housing, including 100 units of low income home ownership for that Habitat for Humanity was planning to build. Um, super exciting about there. And um, and then also opportunities specifically for, you know, um, you know, kids aging out of foster care, but not in like some little skanky group home um, that was like, you know, segregated from every place else, but it would be all throughout, you know, the, the, the project throughout all of the, the 
the all of them, which I thought was a really, really smart move on the part of that that developer. And then there was also 200,000 square feet of light manufacturing, cultural, commercial, retail spaces that that created would have, would have created more than um, 800 permanent jobs, which was super, super duper exciting. And um, and so we were just, you know, we figured, OK, so if we don't get this, at least somebody is at least as good which seemed impossible to believe, um, would actually get this. But that's what we were counting on. But I was very naive at the time, obviously, because our city um, decided to do what they generally always do, which is create um, you know, the business as usual model. So they, they um, handed the project over to um, a development team that consisted of, of only two white male developers. Um, and the winning bid was simply, you know, you know, um, units of extremely low income housing um, with a great big community center and a great big health clinic. Exactly the kind of things those kids were just like, I'm not coming back to a neighborhood if that's all it is. Um, and uh, and so it was a really a painful time, you know, for me. But you know, we're still at it. We've still got some things going, lots of things going on. And um, you know, I've not given up on creating that scale of a project. And um, hopefully, within the next couple of years, you will see it. Um, but uh, in the meantime, you know, I I love that this um, this quote from Dr. King as from a letter from a Birmingham jail. And for those of you that have not read this letter, it's a quick read, but it, he wrote it. At, in the Birmingham jail in response to an open letter from a group of white clergymen in Birmingham um, who published an open letter in the paper, you know, asking King to, uh, or giving him all sorts of reasons for like slowing down on this integration thing. And, and he was like, mm, I don't think so. Because, you know, our patient, our impatience is legitimate and unavoidable which I think is really true. And the lead whole letter is really kind of incredible because, you know, we've, I think, you know, what he was responding to and what certainly I respond to as well is that, you know, the continued business as usual, you know, leads to the same kind of crazy um, problems that, you know, essentially build like these almost tributes to all of our collective failures when we could in fact be building the kind of great, want to build some monuments? How about we build monuments to hope and opportunity and possibility for what a future that we can create to show that we don't have to move out of our neighborhood in order to live in a better one. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Majora. I'm looking at all the claps and thumbs up. And oh, uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, trying to get back in so I could, I think I can see, I can see everybody. But I'd rather. The Q&A, there's oh, some yeah. folks um, giving you some love in the Q&A. And yes, a couple of I know. Let me get that. Okay. Wow. While you're getting it up. I just, we just so appreciate you are an amazing storyteller in addition to being an expert. And so it's just such a pleasure to have you and to hear um, all the amazing work that you've done. And, and so I'm seeing some of that in the Q&A and in the chat as well. Thank you. So I'm loving that. All right, so oh, so I guess you know, yeah, think we've got time, so I can um, go right into um, some of these questions. So, hello, Miss Lynette Pearl. Um, so, how do you encourage uh, the? Yeah, because you can't, you guys can't see the question, so I'll read the question out. Um, so, how do you encourage those with higher incomes to buy into the mixed income concept? Um, and so, the interesting thing about this talent retention approach is that many of those people of higher incomes are already in our community and are not necessarily leaving our communities because they feel as though there's nothing there. But in many cases, that kind of housing, and I'm not talking like, you know, filthy rich people who can whatever, live anywhere they want. I mean, just like regular people who are doing better than well above the poverty line. You know, often we're talking about, you know, folks between like 135, um, you know, maybe to 200 AMI. You know, which again, you are not filthy rich when that happens, but nobody's really building opportunities like that for them there. So we want to see, um, we want to see people who are just like happy to be in these neighborhoods because many of them are. And when we, and another thing that we did, we got was that people weren't leaving the neighborhood because they, they felt like there was just awfulness there. They were leaving because there was nothing to do and housing wasn't being built to accommodate them. 
if because if you've got the narrow bands of we're only build you know low income housing in these communities even if you want to stay close to your family and close to people that you knew and grew up with and love but you can't because no one's building that housing so it's really this is about creating more more um supply to meet that demand okay uh wait okay so i'm not sure who this is but there's there's a question um so for many communities in Connecticut, one of the biggest barriers to developing affordable homes are residents and elected officials that block projects for fears that increasing density changes the character of their town. Um, and I guess I, my follow-up question for that is, is so are, are these the folks that are, you know, in um, you know, sort of wealthier areas where, and they're essentially saying we don't want people like that here? Um so that's it. Yeah. And, I would assume so. I, I yeah, the okay. person submitted the question anonymously, so I can't ask for clarification, but I, based on living in Connecticut, yes, yes okay. I think that's what they mean. <laughs> yeah. Because there's also, honestly, I mean, the kind of things that I get, even in, in a low status community where people are fearful, you know, of the, the, the character of the community changing because they're just, they're like, okay, at least it's slightly affordable right now, but it's about to get worse. So I've, I've seen it on both, on both both sides, um, you know, quite frankly. And um, and I feel like, to be honest, those aren't the places where I work because I just can't, I'm not, it's just, I think we can do so much better in low status communities and work to create more, um, you know, opportunities to, for more economic diversity there with with most folks and again there are some people who are just like no matter what it's a horrible horrible thing but our survey all of our data showed us that people were kind of more than okay with like increasing you know more economic diversity within within low status neighborhoods because they felt as though the better more status they wanted protections so that they would have places to live too they were real clear about that and they and 100% agree with them but mostly they were just like Look, they, they know, I mean, they felt and they weren't wrong that truly low status communities, nobody really cares about them. And they would actually wanted to have people of higher status there because they felt that they would bet they would have the benefit, you know, of actually being associated with that. And so and, and they're not wrong. They're not wrong. And that's why we work in low status communities. Cause I'm honestly, I don't, I'm not banging my head up against a the wall. There's just, this is already hard enough to do anything. Um, even in wherever you are. So I'm just like, you know what? You want to stay there? You, you, you buy. Um, oh, and somebody, Gus Christensen. Wait, do I? Oh, wait. But okay, I'm sorry. I'm just reading this. But great, Gus. I, so I'm really terrible with names, but I think I know you. Um, Gus Christensen. I love Hunts Point and I love the Boogie Down Grind. I used to get coffee there every morning. The area is so appealing now that I did a reverse commute up from the Upper East Side to my office in the banknote building for years. Oh, what a beautiful building. And I'm so excited about Broxlandia. Oh my goodness, Russ. Okay, so holler at me because I'm, now, I'm so bad with names. I'm super, super bad. And you could be describing a bunch of folks that I know, but anyway, just just, just hit me up. And, uh, and so, so, but I guess you're, now you're in Connecticut. So love to hear what you're doing now. Um, so thank you for saying that. I appreciate you. It's always nice for someone who's actually like been to what I'm talking about. Um, hi, and Luz Osuba. Um, did you get any oppositions on the plans? Yeah, I did. So um, it's been, you know, and it's been really fascinating because, you know, and in, in I think part of the, the one, some of the, the, the challenges of, of working in a, in a low status community um, of, of any color, you know, is we're the when you start doing things and saying things like, no, we should, we can, we can have, we should have economic local economic development. No, we everybody should be able to have, you know, a decent quality of life. E like economic diversity is not a bad thing. Um, and uh, and it was a really great, amazing kind of thing that we could with we should our neighborhood should develop and prosper along with us in them. But Truly, I think that that's not the way, you know, when if poverty is considered a cultural attribute. And again, in my experience, it often is, you know, by, um, you know, uh, the, the nonprofit industrial complex, you know, the government that supports it, as well as local businesses, I mean, as well as like, frankly, real estate developers who do really well 
you know, sort of doing the concentration, you know, of of quote of only affordable housing in these in these neighborhoods. Um, I feel like the the opposition comes from people not believing that our neighborhoods can be anything except these sort of like repositories for like the the low expectations placed on our communities. And so it, I have to like have a, a lot of compassion for folks because, you know, look, that was me. I wanted to be like far, far away from my neighborhood, you know, growing up because I didn't believe that there was any real value here either. But, you know, what I have seen that's been really beautiful over the years is that and it literally just happened a little while ago. One of one of, one of the most recent ones where I got a uh, you know an, a note from someone who apologized for being one of my haters, <laughs> and now understands why I do what I do, and 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 has been like a great champion, you know, of the things that that happen. And again, it takes time. I mean, look, we've had four hundred years, you know, of, of essentially what is a white supremacist, you know, viewpoint that is that and that that is a um and template that's attached. To our communities, it makes us feel like we like there's not no value in it. I don't, and honestly, I think white supremacy is bad for white people too, um, especially poor ones, um, because you know, it didn't develop to like so that white people could really be unified. It was it really developed so that the planner class would keep the rest of the white people in line, and white people didn't understand that, like they get it, but um, unfortunately, not too many of us do. But I feel like. Um, yeah, I think that's where we, that's how we overcome the challenges. We just keep doing what we do and people see the value in it for themselves, not for themselves, like how the community gets better for themselves. And that makes me super happy. Um, so thank you, Diane, for the love. Kathy Ekstrom, uh, uh, what does Majora call the op the opposite of low status communities? High status communities, you know, they're just like the places where that honestly people from low status communities <laughs> aspire to be in and would sooner spend money there than in their own neighborhoods. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, and, and LaShawn, how do you fight against the business as usual folks who are not listening? I just keep talking to the ones that, that pay attention. Because you, can, I mean, I mean, I I realize I spent, especially in my early years, and not even that early, <laughs> you know, it's just so much time trying to get people who just were not interested in anything that we were doing and were openly oppositional, as opposed to spending time, you know, with the ones who saw value in it and bolstering them up so that we could be working together, and I just. Like I literally just, it's, it's, I'm, it's not like writing them off because, you know, look, I feel like this work is, is, is my ministry, right? It's like, I love God. I love my, and this is my man, the manifestation of me loving my neighbor. And it also means that I have to like define neighbor really broadly, even people who really cannot stand what I do. Um, but I have to be open whenever they are, whenever they are. Um, and, um, uh, and it's not always pretty. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, we, our local community board, which is, has been openly hostile, you know, to me as a, um, frankly, as a black female uh, developer, you know, who's not trying to 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 work with with any of the folks that they've like ordained as the people who should be working in their community. Even though it's my community, and I was here before any of them. <laughs> That's a whole other story, but. I can't, you know, it's just like, I can't, but we, for the Bronxlandia, you know, um, you know, when we wanted our liquor license, I just took into serious consideration the kind of openly hostile attacks that I personally received, you know, from this board, knowing full well that it was their, their role um, in getting a liquor license was simply uh, a, a, an advisory role. I chose to like notify them, which is all I had to do and then stay away from them and not have to submit myself to their horribleness. And then they, and I don't know how they did it, but they were able to like get our liquor license removed on a technicality. And, and it was horrifying. Um, and they did effectively stop us from actually working for an entire summer, but I did depend on my, on, on the community and just put it out there. And, you know, and it's funny because I realized that I, I'd never really talked about how hard some of this stuff was. And I put it out on social media. I'm like, look, 
this is what's happening. They are literally stopping us from moving this project forward and I need your help. And people like came out <laughs> and I was just, even I was surprised, you know, at the level of support that, that we got. Um, and just, it was, it was crazy pants and beautiful. And I don't, don't think I'd ever felt like that supported in my life. And, but why, but literally think about why I was supported. I would built something that folks saw value in. So they were just might as well just been supporting themselves. Cause if they didn't see any value in it, they wouldn't have done it. And that's what I realized. That's what we, that's what we have to do. I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, so this, so Liz, okay. Good. Um, Liz Stern. It's so easy for me to translate the story into a Connecticut story in the tourist driven economy that I live in. I'm substituting the tourist driven community. I'm sorry. Um, it's so easy for me to translate this story into a Connecticut story in the tourist driven community that I live in. Okay. I'm substituting the tourist driven community and the unaffordable, unlivable conditions. Yeah, that could be a problem. I can totally see that. Um, I've been using Majora's book as a guide. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you found it helpful. Um, really appreciate you. Uh, 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 thank you for the talent retention strategy. Yeah, Connecticut is an aging state. One of the challenges that we're facing is the loss of our talent pool. Yeah, one of the, some of the best practices you've seen across communities to retain young adults in the communities. Yeah, the same reason we focused on things like cafes and all the things that were in the list that, that people said that they left the neighborhood to experience and made sure that we were bringing them to our neighborhood. Like literally our cafe was the first, um, you know, cute coffee shop or anything like that gathering space that um, we had in our neighborhood that wasn't a community center in more than, since I was in, since I was in high school, actually the, the last one closed while I was in high school. <laughs> so it was, that was, and I graduated high school in 1984. So this, that, so building those things, giving people reasons to want to stay and just think about why they're going in the first place, is it, are we creating value for people in their community so that they can see their neighborhood and want to invest emotionally and socially? Because if, because that, I know it seems like such a, a silly thing, but when you ask people what they were doing and why, it was literally like, I need a place to feel cool in. I want to, you know, I need to meet my, my future ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, someplace cool you know, cause they ain't coming here. And I mean, it was, it was really just that simple. And I think you'll see more of that happening. Um, yeah. Housing. Oh, Denise, uh, my French is really bad. Sev Sevigo. Okay. I'm sorry for, for mutilating your name, but folks, she said, focusing on community and creating a sense of place is so important. Housing doesn't exist in a vacuum. No, that's why even if you have a cheap place and a place that doesn't really like make you feel great, you're eventually just going to like bite the bullet and maybe go someplace a little more expensive. And, and I'm literally thinking of people from my own neighborhood who did that and who I like, I'm so sad that they're not here anymore, but eventually that's what happens. Um, uh, and not surprised with you at a disappointment when the project didn't work. Have you worked with B Corps to um, recruit socially responsible investors? And so we're not so much working with, with B, B I was actually a B Corp, my, my main company. Um, but honestly, it was just like too much to go through the process. And so I was just like, I can't. Um, but that's one of where, as part of our plan for um, uh, using the a, a crowdfunding investment platform, I mean, that kind of is that ability for people to invest where they want and also give people, you know, with with barriers to entry, enter as an accredited inventor, investor to do that kind of stuff. So that's, so we're really excited about that. And yes, we are definitely talking to as many socially responsible investors, but even then I got to tell you, because we're not, um, I do, I think on some level, some of the returns might not be as much as folks would like to see. And, and, and it's been my experience that if socially responsible investors, most of them are just investors and will look at the bottom line and look at a neighborhood like mine in the current condition that it's in right now and often don't see the future that I see, regardless of what our numbers say. So, because there are other easier things for them to invest in, you know, that's, that's another problematic thing that I see. Um, so we've got Logan, One Tension Hartford, 
Singerman, Logan Singerman. One, one tension Hartford has is that many communities outside the city are resistant to building low-income housing, deed restricted affordable, absolutely. Um, Hartford ends up building more and more and carrying more of their fair share. Yes, that's why so many of the communities in Hartford are low status communities. There are many residents who also advocate for more low-income housing due to the need, whatever a project is provoked. How do you navigate the tension of meeting the pressing need residents see for affordable housing and the longer-term dream of building a community kids want to return to? There is nothing, you, the only thing you can do is actually have the kind of political will who is going to be like, I believe. It's a story that's in my book. Um, this was right after the city under the de Blasio administration decided to 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 take this this idea that I literally had created under the Bloomberg administration. And that administration was interested in doing, and they had just awarded it to the to do the same business as usual thing. And I had a chance to 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 ask the mayor at the time. And I was like, so what are we going to do about the concentration of 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 um of of poverty, you know, within neighborhoods like mine, where we know statistically low 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 educational attainments, higher rates of of you know unemployment, la la la, and gave the list. And to his credit, he was like, "Oh yeah, it does that." And then, but quietly, that's what he said in front of the large group of people. But quietly, he said to me, "You know, look." Um, I 100% agree with you, but I've got people, you know, low income housing advocates who are just like, we need more low income housing. And then I've got developers who love building low income housing because of the developer fee. What could I do? And I was just like, show some leadership. You just had an opportunity to do that. You literally had the opportunity to do that, but you chose not to, or maybe your people did and you didn't do anything about it, or you didn't tell your people. Like they, cause they had a chance to do exactly that. And so you can't, and there's a, there's a point where I feel like politically it's just, I mean, it's just expedient. You can't say otherwise. And, um, and it is the developers who do, do the can, I know, it was uh, of course not lost on me that in particular for the project that we lost, um, they were two very large, you know, campaign donors. So, but with political, but also folks on the ground Provoke, pro providing a different opportunity. And then then when they meet, that's how it happens. Majora, we're right about at time. Oh. There's still some more questions. I don't know if you're able to type in answers to ones that you know you have time for. Um, okay. I'm noting that your last question was if you could share strategies that you use to keep calm and move forward and what your internal dialogue is. And so I felt like that was like a great way to promo the next, the lunchtime session, which is you know figuring out your affordable housing then. Um, but if you can, you know, maybe provide 15, 20 seconds on that before we yeah. close out. And, and also before I do that, if you want the, the questions that are, I don't, I have no idea how to do it, but if you want me to, if you can copy those questions yes. and then yes. I can type them out and that you could send them to whoever the, the folks are, that'd be great. Perfect. Um, But ultimately like, look, like I think I said before, this is like my, this is, this is my, my ministry. Like I feel honestly called to do what I do. And, um, that makes me super happy, you know, so that, you know, I try to take better care of myself than I once did, um, you know, both my, my, my spiritual as well as my mental and physical health, because there are moments when I'm like, this is just horrifying. Mm -hmm. But I do think you've got to take time for yourself um, because no one will give it to you. And you are not, a, I am not a renew, um, a, a, a non-renewable reset. Wait, what am I? When, you know, if you, if you don't like to keep pouring like good into yeah. it and take care, it's, it doesn't come back. It just doesn't. And this is someone who worked herself into the hospital twice. I'm not working myself into the hospital again, ever. Just not going to do it. Because I love that. Yes. So I, you're not done. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I'm not done. Exactly. But yeah. Thank, thank so you fun. so much for sharing your knowledge and your passion and your time and your stories and your talent with all of us here in Connecticut today. We'll get you those questions. Oh. Um, and just thank you for being our guest. And um, next, we'll take a short uh, lunch break. You can meet back online at 12 for our plenary session. But as I mentioned, we also have that lunchtime Zen session for you. So if you want to hop over and, you know, eat your lunch off camera while you learn um, some of those, <laughs> those tactics, please do. And we'll see you at our 12 p.m. plenary session. Thank you so much, Majora. Thank you all. All right. Take good care. Bye.